Well, good morning, church. It's so good to worship, isn't it? And God is good. He is uh, in control. He's in charge. And no matter what happens, He knows always what to do and how to help us through. Um, I know that an announcement was mentioned that somebody from Canada had said it wasn't. I mean, we're not used to this. And I actually did promise him he could preach here one of the Sundays, but... Uh, I think I'm going to wait until it's warmer to, before I let him preach. I think that would be wise, right? He needs to adjust to our, our comfortable temperatures here. Um, well, I was just so encouraged and blessed through the worship, through the special song, through singing, and <clears throat> just be reminded of that sometimes we don't know what we're doing. We have sometimes no clue. We think we do. We want to do well. We want to do best. and we, uh, we don't know what to do, but God always does. He always knows what he's doing. And he always knows uh, what to do and what the answer is, no matter what we feel or what we go through. So we can trust him. Now, uh, we are in a series of messages on uh, family. And we've been talking about what it looks like to be a uh, godly, healthy husband, what it looks like to be a godly, healthy wife. And I trust you have been able to put that in your, into practice already. And, you know, the interesting thing is when we make an effort, often it feels like the temptations are so much greater, right? But we always know if we will hold on to God, he will, we will do uh, what he wants us to do. It's going to be better, and it's going to get better. Now, we're going to shift our, our attention a little bit from marriage to parenting. And I know not all of you are parenting, and I also realize our, some of you are children. But there is so much because it's all about relationships, there's so much in it that we can all learn, no matter what the topic is, no matter what we aim it to, but there's always a lot of things to learn from. And so I, I trust that you will be encouraged and blessed. And if you want to grab your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and that's where we will be at. Um, and I'm uh, just going to shift a little bit from marriage to parenting this morning. I truly believe that Satan does, makes his very best effort to destroy families. Because if he can destroy the family, he destroyed the future. And that is what he's after. He wants to destroy. My prayer is that you will be able to again this morning see parenting from God's eyes and not from human eyes. It looks quite different from God's eyes than from Google. I don't know if you know that. It looks quite different from what the world is trying to tell us how to parent than what God says. And, and certain things is taking, I'm taking a little risk to be the messenger because some of you may disagree. And, you know, and I'm not telling you how to raise your children and train them, but I do want to tell them just do it in the Lord and do it His ways. And it will be good. And so we're going to look into that. You know, God's greatest concern is not what the president does to our family. It's what the parents do to their family. That's God's greatest concern. And so today we just want to turn our attention to God's word and see what he says about parenting. Let's read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first command with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, when you look at that, one assumption that Paul makes first is that we have read the first five chapters before we got here. See, Paul did not start this letter giving instructions on parenting. He had already given other instructions first before he got here. Ephesians could be broken into two parts. You could really divide it into two parts. It only has six chapters. And so the first three chapters, they give us our position in Christ, who we are. And the last three chapters, they tell us now how to practice that out in Christ. 
In other words, what we should do. So the first three chapters tell us what we believe, and the last three chapters, they tell us how we should behave now, that we are believers. So I, I want you to just get it. What he's saying is that you cannot apply gospel parenting if you are not a gospel person. You can't practice Ephesians 6 if you don't believe Ephesians 1. So in other words, you cannot live what you haven't put in. And so as a parent, you cannot pass on what you don't have. That's really what it means. And so Paul shows us how to be gospel-centered parents only after he showed us how to be gospel parent people. Because you, that's the only way you will be able to be a gospel parent. So, the truth is, godly parenting is extremely difficult. Have you ever noticed? It's extremely difficult. The reason is because we don't always know. You are not going to be perfect in your parenting. You will not always do what is right. You will not always know what to do. It's extremely hard, godly parenting. But since God created you, and He created your children, it's still always the best way to look at God's ways and not our own or Google. So my first point, godly parenting will demand, obe they will demand obedience from their children at home. Look again, verse 1 through 3, Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first command with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Now, one thing we got to understand when you read this is that Paul didn't wrote this just primarily to children. But he wrote this also for parents to enforce it. It's not like God expects children to grab their Bibles and just grasp the truth. Children are to obey their parents, and the parents are to make sure that it happens. So why would Paul command parents to make sure kids obey? Because you don't have to be a parent very long, and you will realize that your children, just naturally on their own, are not just going to obey you. They, they will not. They will have to be trained to obey. Little kids, the Bible says, when they get their own mind and their own will, it will be bent toward sin. So you have to teach them to obey because that doesn't come naturally. You have to teach them. Proverbs chapter 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. You see, the reason is so simple. The reason is you're training up a child in the way this child should go. So, if you don't train the child in the way it should go, they will naturally go the way they shouldn't go. Folks, our kids need to understand that from the time that they are born, that obedience is not an option. It's not a way. It's the only way that our children need to obey. It's an obligation. You may say, well, that sounds so stern. But you know what? Not when you see the bigger picture. When you will begin to see this from God's eyes, then it's not that stern. Your child's obedience is really not for your sake. It's for the Lord's sake. Children are to obey their parents in the Lord, it says. What does that mean? Colossians 3.20 puts it that like this. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. 
So the real motivation for obedience is to please the Lord. So citizens should obey police officers because it pleases the Lord. Employees should obey their boss because it pleases the Lord. Students should obey their teachers because it pleases the Lord. Children should obey their parents because it pleases the Lord. So as you teach them to obey, at the same time, you are teaching them to be pleasing to the Lord. Now, Paul uses another word than just obedience here. Have you noticed? They, these are two words that he, that he mentions here, and they are equally important. But yet, I think so many times we miss that one word altogether. We just completely exclude it. What does he say in verse 2? It says, honor your father and mother. Now here there, you see there's two things expected of children and be taught by parents. Obedience and honor. You see that? Obedience and honor. Obedience is the action. Honor is the attitude. Obedience is, is the outward and honor is the inward. I mean, you probably have heard a story of this little boy, he misbehaved, and mom says, you know what? For misbehaving, you're going to have to sit in the corner and face the corner for 30 minutes. And he goes, and he's obediently doing it. And about 20 minutes later, she goes and checks up on him, and, and he says, so how are you doing, son? And he says, oh, I'm okay, mom, but I want you to know that I am sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm standing. See, that's the inward attitude, right? Now, just doing it isn't real obedience. It's obedience, if you do it only outwardly, it's obedience without the heart and the mind. And that's why you hate it when, when you tell your children something to do or you share something with them and they eventually say, okay, Dan, and then they roll their eyes. Again, they're doing it obediently, outwardly, but their attitude isn't right. There is no honor towards you in that. If the honor isn't there, Eventually, it will not last. Even outward obedience will not last. And you may say, well, so what? Why, it is, so, why is it so important to teach our children not only just to obey, but also to obey an attitude? Because a child who is being taught to obey by their parents, but they can dishonor their parents, they will eventually learn to obey God but not love God. And a child, once they will grow up where they are no longer under the influence and care of the parents, then they will begin to do neither. So I think, parents, we need to understand that we are training our children in, to trust us as parents. And if we train them to obey and trust us, for us who they can't see, then when they grow old enough, they will learn to be obedient and honor God who they cannot see. Children who refuse to obey and honor their parents will grow up and will become adults who will refuse to obey and honor the Lord. So parents, when you allow them to disobey and dishonor, in a sense, you are training them to disobey and dishonor the Lord. Now, what's the number one goal in parenting? What should be, or what is the number one goal in parenting? It's not having good sons and daughters, but it's having godly sons and daughters following humbly, dedicatedly Jesus Christ. That's what's most important. If you don't get that right, nothing really matters, right? So when, when we relax and when we are lazy and teaching our children to obey us, 
they are seriously hindering their future to willingly honor and obey Christ. Secondly, healthy godly parents deliver encouragement to their children at home. Look at verse 4, the first part in verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Now, it says here fathers, but it's including mothers. The Bible often refers to fathers because they were called to be the leaders. But it's, it's for parents. And so it's, the word provoke means to stir up or irritate or frustrate. So we should not provoke our children, but rather promote them. We should not put them down. We should build them up. We should not discourage them. We should encourage them. Paul says in, in Colossians 3.21, he says, Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. So what are some ways that we can embitter our children? I, I want to point out a few just for us to know so that we don't do that. So I'm going to use so to say the negative, to see what we can do for the positive. Just a few. Overprotection. Overprotection. You will embitter your child by being overprotected. It's so hard to know where to draw the line. But we have to draw the line. But parents who smother their children, overly restrict them, and everything they do or can go, they never trust them to do anything on their own and constantly questioning their judgment. Eventually, they will build a barrier between their child and themselves. You know, kids absolutely need careful guidance. They absolutely need certain restrictions. But when we prevent them from every single risk, eventually, they will get an angry mood. Especially when they will see that they are under pressure and restriction ten times worse than all their friends around them. They will, they will grow an angry mood. Favoritism. It's unfair to compare one child with another. You may have one student that, that brings you, that, that, that the student does its best in school, brings you straight A's, and then you have another child does its very best in school, and brings you straight C's. It's unfair for that child to compare it with the one that has good grades. And if you do, there's a guarantee that they will draw back, and they will shy away from you, and eventually they will become bitter. Or overindulgence. Give them everything they want. I mean, everything your child wants, they get it. The one time you can't do it, and they're going to throw a fit with you. I mean, you're not going to be kidding. Right? Overindulgence creates an entitlement attitude into our children. And they will walk through life taking it into adulthood and thinking that they're entitled. I'm entitled to this. And it's going to be a disaster and a blow when they don't get what they think they're entitled to. Because they have an entitled attitude and it, they will become bitter. Spoiled kids rarely make humble servants. Unrealistic goals. Don't push them to certain goals that they can probably not accomplish. You know, it's, it's an unrealistic goal, but you're pushing them to that unrealistic goal. And I haven't even quite achieved that. And now you're already pushing him to an, an unrealistic goal that's even above and more than that one. And eventually you will just create in them a mood that whatever I do is never sufficient. Whatever I do, it's always short from what I should be doing. And they carry that into their adulthood. And some people, if they've been grown up that way, when they're adults, they may go and turn around and pass that same attitude, unrealistic goals, onto their children. Or they may turn it against their spouse. People like that normally have never, they can never 
praise their spouse. They can never say thank you what you did or what you said that was so great. They only will focus and make the spouse feel like they can just, they're always a couple of feet short from being good enough for what they did. And it creates bitterness and, and, and hurts. Or feeling unwanted. Children should never be made feel that they are the burden to the parents. That they are in the way for the parents' plans and happiness and what they would like to do in life. It will create bitterness. They will become resentful. Or neglect. It's the opposite of overindulgence. I mean, you have just barely enough time for your children. You just have barely enough energy for your children. I mean, you, you really just don't have it, but, but you just have to just squeeze it in and just always barely can give them some attention that they need. I can assure you one thing. If that's what you do, they will look for attention somewhere else. And there is this one ugly, ugly country song. It says, looking for love in all the wrong places. And that's what they'll do. If you just barely have enough time for them and it's just completely neglecting them for what you should be doing. Physical or verbal abuse, don't abuse them, whether verbally or physically. And you're not going to get it all right. And I can assure you, I, I failed in many of those areas grow, in raising my children. And it's so hard when you realized you did and, and you really wish you could reverse it. But when you do, you're going to have to apologize. But just be careful. Don't physically or verbally abuse them. If you do, again, they will become discouraged and they carry it into their adulthood. Important thing in parenting is that you stay truthful to your children and you maintain consistency. Your children know what you're going to do. You are consistent and whatever you do, you're consistent. So they, they don't have to guess what's going to come. They know. My next point is healthy, godly parents, they will develop discipline in their children at home. This is, it might be, be a little bit of a difficult one, right? Look at verse 4b. Bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Disciplined children grow up and become disciplined adults. It starts at home. In Proverbs 19, 18, it says, Discipline your children while there is hope, otherwise you will ruin their lives. It says two very important things. It says, do it while there is still hope. What it says is, don't wait. Don't wait in disciplining your children. The longer the legs, the harder it gets. So don't wait. If you're not going to discipline them when you look down on them, they will laugh in your face when they will have an eye level with you. So there is a time and a point where it's just too late to do it. Start early. And next, how you discipline your child will determine the quality of his or her life. Notice God doesn't say, parents, if you don't discipline your kids, they will ruin their life. That's not what it says. It says, parents, if you don't discipline your kids, you, mom and dad, are ruining their lives. You see who God puts the blame and the responsibility on? On the parents. Now, does that mean that If there is a bad kid, that every kid that's bad has bad parents? No. It only means that God makes it incredibly clear that a loving, responsible, godly parent should not neglect the important work of discipline in the lives of their children. Do you know why so many people refuse to discipline their children? Because it's hard. It's exhausting. It's extremely exhausting. 
It stinks while you're at it. It's not fun. But the result, the Bible says, is wonderful. It's like potty training. It stinks while you're at it, while you go through it. It's hard. But you have consistency. You stick to it. And you keep doing it as bad as it feels and it is going through it. But when you're done, it's marvelous. That It's good. The result is always worth the effort. Stick with it. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11 says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Do you want children of righteousness and peace? Well, that's what we produce in our children if you're training them in that. Now, discipline is not something that we do to our children. This is, disciplining our children is something that we do for our children. It's a gift from us parents to our children. It's a, a gift. Now, are they going to applaud us during that, during that time? No. They may be mad at us while they're young. But they will be so grateful when they are grown up and wise that they had parents that cared about them to discipline them. The Bible says that God disciplines those he loves. So when you are disciplining your children, you are actually loving your children. You are caring for them. You're not going to let them become unrighteous and unpeaceful people. You're so loving them that that will not happen under your training. So discipline is super important because it helps a child to learn to respect authority. The child that doesn't learn to respect authority from their parents, they will not respect authority in the classroom. They will not respect authority in the church. They will not respect authority uh, to the Lord. And ultimately, they will become a rebel, a fool. And if they keep going like that and they don't break that stronghold, they will die and they'll go to hell. That's what the Bible says. If we withhold correction from our children, then we're making them an, a candidate for eternal punishment. This is probably the toughest verse in the Bible when it comes to discipline. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. It says, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. Oh boy, if you're going to go against Google here, right? Against what the world says, how you should discipline your children. Let me explain this. <clears throat> this proverb gives an image of a shepherd and his sheep. It would have made more sense for them when it was written than it does to us because we are not so familiar with that. But a shepherd has a rod. Now, if there is a sheep that's in rebellion, and wants to wander away from the herd, that sheep is putting itself in danger where a wild beast can come and kill it and devour it. Or if a sheep are wandering, they're, they're, the shepherd leads them. If there is a sheep that wanders away from the path, it can get so close to the edge of the cliff and can fall and get killed itself. And so here it says, talks about the rod. So what the shepherd did with a rod, he would then go in and hit it enough to inflict some pain on that sheep on the side to steer it back to the herd or back into the right path to save him from death. So it was for the sheep's good, for its own good. And so if it would inflict some pain, the sheep would remember, if I go there again, it hurts. They don't see the danger of death but they would see that if I go there, it hurts, so I better stick with the crowd. I better stick on the right path where all the other sheep walk. 
That's what really the image is here from a shepherd and sheep. And now this is referred to disciplining our children. So what it really is just simply saying is this. There is a spot on a human body. It's right below the lower back and above the legs. And if you have to, in order to discipline your child, to inflict some pain, you use that spot and they will not die from it. And you will save them from death. Now, again, you're not talking abusing people and kids. You're not talking to spank them every week or every day or every month. But the world tells us that there is zero tolerance for spanking. If you check Google, I didn't actually, but if you check Google, it will tell you that that's totally wrong. Well, actually, Google tells you everything you want to know. If you want to tell you it's right, you will find that too. Google just is like a wave. It just comes and goes back and forth. Whatever you want on it, you will find. But God says discipline is so important. And so do it wisely. But if you have to, whatever it is, discipline your children so that they will not die. The, the picture of God's eyes, from God's eyes for parenting, is to even not make them a candidate for eternal punishment. That they will seek God. It's hard. But that's what, what the Bible teaches. And I raised two sons. I know what it's like, and you don't always get it right. But I believe that you got to do it with love. You sit them down, you talk to them, you tell them that you love them, and you tell them that it really hurts you, but I was gracious to you, and I gave you three warnings. I first told you, don't do it again. The second time I told you, if you will do it again, I will spank you. And then the third time they test that, are you going to be a person of your word and then spank them, even if though it will hurt your heart more than it hurts them physically? Because, but don't abuse. It has to be for the right reason and purpose in God's ways. I don't know, that may cost me something. Uh, my last point, godly parenting. They will devote instruction for their children at home. Verse 4 says, bring them up. It's the last part in verse 4. Bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So spiritual instruction is a lot more than just dropping off your kids at church or at Sunday school or at VBS. It's a lot more than just buying them a Bible and say, read it. Spiritual instruction is not just depending on the church or the VBS teachers or Sunday school teachers. Spiritual instructions is you sit down with your child. It says, bring them up in a discipline and an instruction that comes from the Lord. And you teach them about the Lord yourself. You know, the most wonderful testimony that a child can give is saying, I was still very young, and one of my parents helped me to see my need for Jesus and his love for me, and I accept Christ as my Savior and Lord. It's the best testimony any person can give because the parents were involved. The parents taught them. They read the Bible with them. They had Bible stories with them. They showed them the gospel, the good news of Jesus and our condition and our fall. You know, we like to, 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 to blame everything on everybody else or on every other system. But we need to be involved. We need to do the job at home. And, and, and the thing is, parents are to do it. Children should not tell the parents where they're wrong and what, what they're all doing wrong. If they do, that's a dishonor. The parents need to teach the children. And, and, and don't just expect your kid to develop good social skills with their friends. You hang out with them. You develop the social skills with them. Not just depending on friends. Teach them. It doesn't matter how much your kids know if they don't know Jesus. It doesn't matter how much your kids have if they don't have eternal life. 
So the challenge I want to give you is give your children spiritual instructions. Start early. Start young. And stick to it. Stick to it. And it, it will produce righteousness and peace. We have all heard this little story from the three little pigs and this big bad wolf, right? I don't know the story very well, but I'm just going to make an illustration out of it. This big bad wolf, he huffs and puffs, and he blows the house down because it's built out of straw to devour and destroy those little pigs. And then on that second house, he huffs and he puffs because, and this house falls apart because it's built out of wood. So to destroy the little pigs. The enemy is trying to devour them. And then at third house, he huffs and he puffs with all force. Nothing moves. The little pigs are safe from the enemy because it's built out of bricks. It's built out of rock. It's not going to fall. Whether your house will stand or fall, it, it depends on the material that you have used to build a home. If you build your family based up on God's word, based up on the obedience of God's and his ways, our families will stand. Even when the enemy will huff and puff, try to devour and destroy our families, try to destroy our children, try to destroy our marriage. But if you will constantly see God's ways and stick to him, hold on to him, fight for him, there is no conflict that, conflict that can't be solved. There's nothing that we cannot get right if we will truly let the Holy Spirit work in us and through us, through God's word. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you <clears throat> for this morning. We thank you that we can gather here. We're so thankful for your instructions. And we know that they're always best. And so many times we see parenting only through our own eyes, but not through your eyes, Lord. But this morning, we just looked at your word and what parenting looks through your eyes. And we want our children to be righteous and peaceful. We want our children to learn to, to get to know you and love you. And we see through your eyes what that looks like. And that we have a gift, a responsibility to give that gift to our children. And we want to do that. Father God, we know we will not always get it right. We will fail. And we may be in times where we go through hard times ourselves and don't do such good of job, but as we've been reminded of your word this morning, help us to parent your way, God. Because you have created us, you have created our children. You know them best, you know best. We want to do it your way. And help us to do that, to raise a generation that will love you, will serve you humbly. And bless us as we will Seek your ways and your leading and your guidance in our lives. Also bless us through this day as we leave here. Make us a blessing to others and protect us in this kind of weather. Keep us safe. I also pray for anyone that listens online and the Holy Spirit has spoken to them. May they respond to your truth. And just help us to be able to do that, to rely on you instead of our own strength. And then do what we know you, Holy Spirit, are leading us to. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.